Welcome. Join me again for a parable. Jesus told lots of parables, and they are fascinating. Tucked into them were truths about the kingdom of God. Here's one that's uh, fascinating, and it's, um, it's found in Mark's Gospel and chapter 4. <clears throat> Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, and we begin reading at verse 3. Listen. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying thirty, sixty, or even a hundred times. Then Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path, where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, thirty, sixty, or even a hundred times what was sown. Wow, that's a powerful parable. That is absolutely loaded with um, stuff we resemble. And we might want to say, ouch, sometimes to something like that. Well, let's take a look. There's, there are four elements. The farmer, the soil, the seed, and of course, the harvest. These are the things. And we might want to ask ourselves a simple question. Um, who's, the father, who's the farmer? Oh, we could ask, what's the seed? Or what specifically is the soil? Maybe we would ask, who is the soil? And then, of course, what is the harvest? Oh, yes, we know the percentages, but what specifically is the harvest? Well, to take a look at these things, we, we break them out, and let's, let's just take a look at them. The farmer, naturally, the farmer is uh, God. He's the one represented as the one who goes out into his field to sow. And what he does is, frankly, called grace. Notice that it is at his initiative, it is at his expense, and he gives or sows indiscriminately. He just scatters seed everywhere. He doesn't bother to say, well, this is good soil. I'll give it a little more. This is bad soil. I shouldn't put any here. He just scatters seed generously everywhere. The second thing we want to ask is, uh, who's the seed or what is the seed? Well, Jesus tells us in his explanation that the seed is the word of God. 
And the word, Jesus' disciples said, your word is spirit and it is life. So it has all of the ingredients for life in it. All it needs is a receptive host and then, of course, some agreeable conditions of rain and sunlight, which God is generous in giving again. The soil, on the other hand, represents four kinds of people. Yeah, that's you and me. One kind is path. Now, <clears throat> path has no cover. There isn't any shade, uh, perhaps, from trees and uh, no um, underbrush that would uh, provide a little cover. But the worst thing is that it's hard pan. Paths get packed. Matter of fact, the sheep, the sheep were in the fields that we read about at Christmas time. We sing the song um, where the shepherds had their sheep in the fields at the time Jesus was uh, born. But they weren't allowed to do that except for two weeks before the early rains because the sheep packed the soil. Well, people's feet and bicycles and cars and all that kind of stuff do also. And so Jesus talks about how Seeds scattered on the path gets taken away by the birds. Uh, and he, in his explanation, he says it is actually Satan who takes the word away. That's kind of interesting. And then there's another category. This is uh, rocky places. All out here in the west where I am traveling, there are a lot of outcroppings of basalt rock, places where they can't farm. And so you see these patches where they didn't... Uh, they didn't plant wheat. The problem is that weeds grow very easily sometimes there. But, but these rocky places, if the seed sprouts, it has no root. And what happens is that uh, trouble or persecution comes along and people who represent this kind of soil fall away very quickly. I have known lots of people who made a commitment to Christ and they began, but they didn't last Something came up and, and they fell off uh, the wagon or fell back into the old rut of sin and uh, they would be the kind that would be represented by what Jesus calls rocky places. And then there is soil that has thorns. Now this is kind of an interesting one. In his explanation, Jesus says that the worries of this life you know, when we fuss and stew over stuff that's not our problem, we can get our eyes distracted from Jesus and uh, from following him. Another thing is um, the deceitfulness of wealth. Oh my goodness, how many times have I seen people trade the riches of eternal life for, for the junk uh, of materialism? I am teaching Hispanics, uh, ministerial classes and I have said to the people in my tribe out on this district that we need to raise up ministers and spiritual leaders from among those who are already here we bring somebody in from Guatemala or Costa Rica or wherever it isn't long before they get a job and start earning money and then they drop out of ministry and um, they just can't resist the materialism the opportunity to make some money and do it a lot quicker than they can where they came from. <clears throat> so the deceitfulness of wealth is the way Jesus spells it out. And the desire for other things. It could be fame. It could even be for love. It could be for notoriety of some kind. <clears throat> there are things that come up that people trade their eternal life for. And Jesus talks about that. The last category he talks about is good soil. Now there's something about good soil that is productive. I, um, I live over here in Idaho and uh, there is some very productive soil that is being taken out of production and we're building houses on everything. I've driven down through the Treasure Valley down near Boise, Caldwell, Nampa. Some of the richest soil on the face of the earth and it's funny we're we're building houses on that. Over in Israel, they do not build houses on tillable soil. They build houses on the rocky crags where they don't produce their food. But, you know, we don't think very far out ahead, and so we do what 
what is easy and what is uh, immediately uh, wealthy for us. We sell at a good price and we think we've done something great. So <clears throat> what, what has to happen then is the good soil hears the word. It accepts the word and ultimately then by God's grace those who are good soil will produce a harvest. So the question that we have to ask as we think about this and hear Jesus tell this parable, what kind of soil am I? Which of these four soils am I? Now, I know others who represent the other three categories than what I am. <clears throat> and sometimes I wonder, is there anything I can do to change them? Is there anything I can do to help them not be soil with weeds or hard pack, a uh, pathway or rocky places or those things? But in the parable, what I notice is that the farmer doesn't seem to be concerned about changing the nature of the soil. He just sows seed generously. Maybe, it just could be that you and I don't need to be concerned about changing other people. We just need to cooperate with God and allow him to sow his seed generously into everyone's heart and then let them be what they want to be. The fourth thing that I, I read about in this parable is the harvest. So what's the harvest? And uh, <clears throat> it would be easy for us to think that it's good works or that it's uh, perhaps it's uh, souls saved for the kingdom, but that's not what the parable is, uh, is about. The harvest seems to be a relationship that satisfies, that is eternal, that has fulfillment, joy and peace and focus and blessing and all of those kinds of things. And, and the harvest is the result of the seed that sprouts naturally once the conditions are right. I guess that what the best word would be eternal life. Eternal life isn't more of the same old, same old. There's a difference between everlasting life and eternal life. Eternal life is the quality of the life God has. And we can produce it in various quantities, so to speak, the 30, 60, 80, 100 fold. And <clears throat> what we need to do is just be the soil. Ideally, we would step up and allow God to help us be good soil. But the results and, and productivity of even good soil differ. Sometimes it's only 30%. I've known Christians who were 30%, but at least they are good soil with their 30% and 60 and, and even 100. A hundred percent of what is sown. I know, who, I know people who are winsome, who are winning other people. They are a testimony to God's grace that is awesome. Uh, it's amazing what their influence is. They're hundred percenters. I'd like to be a hundred percenter, but you know, I can, what I can be by choice is good soil. And what I produce then will depend on what God is able to help me be or do or whatever that might be. So I try to get everybody to produce at the hundred percent level, but that's impossible. And I drop back and I watch God God is the farmer who simply celebrates the harvest, whether it's 30, 60, or 100%. God celebrates it. Well, here's some concluding observations. The farmer in the story simply went out to sow. I wonder if we are spending too much time getting soil in pots and planters instead of just going out and sowing the seed, being a part of what God is doing. You see, the soil is always out there, not in church or in a pond or pot or wherever it might be. And the farmer is generous with the seed. He scatters freely. 
He doesn't work people and try to get them to be something they're not. He just scatters seed. And the result, of course, of the harvest is 30, 60, or 100 fold in a different season always than when it was scattered and in various amounts, but harvest is harvest. Sometimes farmers talk about there wasn't enough rainfall and the crop wasn't as good this year. Sometimes something like Mount St. Helens blows and man, everything is fertilized and they have bumper crops for years. There are all kinds of conditions, but the farmer celebrates the harvest. After all, a harvest will happen. And when a farmer scatters seed, there will be a harvest. So here's what I learned. You and I are the body of Christ. How about if we just go out and help God sow some seed? Leave the harvest to him. But with the certainty that if we scatter generously along with him, participate in what he is doing, there will be a harvest to celebrate. And you and I can be part of it. Isn't that a great concept? Wow. Pray with me. Father, this is awesome. It's not by our works. It's by God's grace. Help us to be good soil. And it's obvious that God is generous with seed. So as we receive the seed, may it sprout in this good soil that we are becoming. And may there be a good harvest. And may we celebrate it with you. There are others out there also that are soil of various kinds, of course, but help us to participate wherever we can in what God is doing, sowing seed, and then trust that the harvest will, will come and that we will celebrate it with him. Thank you for these words of wisdom. Bless each of us as we've heard it today. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining me today.